Greetings, one and all, and thanks for listening to the China History Podcast. I'm Laszlo Montgomery, here again, bringing you another episode from our Chronological Dynastic Overview series. We're getting closer and closer to the last dynasty. Today, we're looking at the second half of the Song Dynasty, known as the Southern Song. Now, the imperial government is based south of the Yangtze in what is present-day Hangzhou. The Jurchens, or Manchus, had invaded Song lands and took the capital in Kaifeng, and as you recall, they captured almost the entirety of the Song imperial court and marched them back to their capital to suffer a lifetime of indignities and whatnot. They controlled everything north of the Yangtze, leaving everything south of the Changjiang, as it was known in the local language, in the hands of the southern Song rulers. But as I said last time, some got away, and it's their story that we examine in this episode. Okay, so let's get our bearings here. The Southern Song began in 1127 and runs 152 years until they and everyone else, the Jurchens of the Jin Dynasty, the Tangut of the Western Xia, and the Southern Song, everyone by 1279 is taking their orders from the Mongol invaders. Kaifeng, once the largest city in the world, has been sacked, and anyone with good sense has already left town, leaving the city of Constantinople with the title of the largest city in the world at this time. The Jurchen armies kept coming at the Song and didn't stop at the Yangtze. When they converged on Hangzhou, the emperor fled by boat and became the first emperor in Chinese history to sail on a naval vessel. And this actually is one of the signature achievements of the Southern Song, Each dynasty, as we have seen, has their various defining moments, whether it's battles or imperial struggles, uprisings, etc. The Southern Song has its share, but it's during the time of the Southern Song that a permanent standing navy came into being in Dinghai in present-day Zhoushan, near my beloved Ningbo, where my employers are located. As I said in the last episode regarding intra-China trade and commerce, the waterway systems between the Yellow River, the Grand Canal, the Yangtze, and all the other lesser rivers that were part of the vast China intra-aqua network had advanced quite quickly. Some rather big and menacing vessels were already built, so converting a lot of these to a standing navy wasn't a very long stretch. It's not like they had to build it from scratch. Paddle wheel boats were a centerpiece of this navy, some with as many as 12 paddle wheels per side with arrays of crude but very destructive weapons on deck at their disposal. Under the Southern Song, a navy comes into being and becomes integral to fighting the wars with uh, China's enemies and Chinese attitudes about reaching out and expanding contact with all these worlds beyond China's coastline. It gathers more momentum. The three great historic ports of this age were found in Quanzhou, Xiamen, and Guangzhou, and after the Mongols take control of China, even more so do you see Chinese vessels sailing the high seas. In the Ming Dynasty, Chinese naval and maritime vessels made up perhaps the largest and most traveled fleets in the world. And keep in mind, other than the Mongols under Kublai Khan, you really have to get a fine-tooth comb to look for examples where China used their naval power as an invading or a conquering force. Well, the Southern Song doesn't have a very auspicious start. Essentially, they had to make a bitter peace with the Jin Dynasty invaders, these Jurchens, or Manchus, as we more commonly know them. In 1142, a treaty was signed that, although humiliating to the Southern Song rulers, kept things on less than a slow boil. All the Emperor Gaozong had to do was pay an annual tribute, and there was zero wiggle room in this treaty that saved face for the Han Chinese. They had to come right out and say it. China was referred to as, quote, our insignificant state. And when referring to the Jin, it had to refer to them as, quote, your superior state. And they didn't stop there. Historically, in these kinds of treaties, one would be like the big brother or the father. And uh, one would then be like the little brother or the inferior in the relationship or something like that, you know, that showed kinship in, in the language. But these Jin rulers, they were tough, and they never let up in pressing their inferiors. The Gaozong emperor had to refer to himself as Servant Go to the Jurchens, Go being his personal name. I know it doesn't sound like much, but as far as pouring scorn on all the decorum and dignitas of the Song emperor, it was quite an insult and was indicative of how powerless the Han Chinese of the Song were to these fierce northern non-Han peoples. 
The Jurchens threw a cherry on top of this concession and gave the southern Song rulers back the body of the deceased Huizong emperor, whose tragic fate we discussed last time. Anyways, the Jin get theirs, let me tell you, when they chased the Song out of northern China and took over the historical heartland of China, going all the way back to the cradle of Chinese civilization, they had to take the Yellow River as part of the deal. In the 1170s and 1180s, the Yellow River was causing the Jin all kinds of grief, and in 1194, when the Yellow River did one of its patented changing course things, the river turned the entire plain into one big lake. So we're going to come back another day and maybe spend an entire episode discussing these Jurchens and their Jin dynasty. All it takes is two outrageous emperors and a Mongol invasion in 1211, and they're gone within 92 years after this treaty, and are only able to rise again when they establish the last and final dynasty in China in 1644, the Manchu Qing dynasty. Now, the Southern Song, uh, this ran from 1127 to 1279. Nobody actually founded the Southern Song dynasty. The Song is considered a single 319-year dynasty, running from 960 to 1279. It's simply divided between a northern and southern period, depending on where the capital was. All the emperors were still of the same Zhao family of Zhao Kuangyin, who founded the dynasty. So Emperor Gaozong is not considered the founder of the Southern Song, but merely the 10th Song Emperor. What can I say except that despite all the stress caused by the Jurchens, it was another great moment for China, the Chinese, and for Chinese culture. Besides fleeing the north because of the Jurchens, the south eh, held other attractions, such as climate that ranged from balmy to tolerable. And if you were a landscape painter, the south was nirvana. All the best scenic spots beloved by China's greatest landscape painters were here. So you had continued migration of Han Chinese to the south to seek their fortune or perhaps just warmer climes. By this time, block printing was such that books could be had for a reasonable price and they were no longer the possession of only the rich. The lacquerware industry was now just that, an entire industry producing not just for the domestic market but for the ever-growing export market as well. During the Southern Song, you had the fabulous Qingbai ceramics that came out of the kilns of Jingdezhen, a city in Jiangxi blessed with the ultimate deposits of kaolin-enriched clay. This perfect mix of clay allowed for a, a shell-like ceramic ware that gave off a blue and white hue. In this great but little-known city in China, Jingdezhen, in the very north of Jiangxi province bordering Anhui, from Jingdezhen came the blue and white china ware, exported around the world to markets that treasured it for its beauty. And from this blue and white ware from Jingdezhen that followed the song uh, came the word china ware, with a small c, of course. And you could say in some ways that this distinctive blue and white china uh, was in many ways the world's first international brand, because everyone associated it with china it was only found there. The idea of government investing in commerce was now alive and well in southern Song, China. Everyone was hustling during this era, and it was a time when all it took was a nice little how chu to the right official, and you got the monopoly for this or for that. A whole way of doing business evolved, where guanxi, relationships, were everything, and every man had his price. It was during the Song dynasty that the tradition of foot-binding began. Not to get too deep into it, but it began in the early Song, and the practice spread quickly, particularly amongst the upper classes. When a girl reached five or six years old, their feet were already the perfect size, and from that day out, a binding technique was used that molded the feet into these perfect little three-and-a-half-inch lotuses that were so attractive to so many in those days. In the age of the Song, all educated men would acknowledge in those days that from the Stans to South Vietnam, Chinese culture was indeed superior to all those known in Asia. In those lands spreading out over such a great distance, Chinese characters, Zhong Wen, Zi, were used in their writing systems. Mandarin Chinese was the lingua franca. Its system of government, the art, and, well, everything about it was head and shoulders above everything else, and admired and copied and adapted. And for at least a hundred years or so, the Song enjoyed a very nice high, and rarely had China seen better days. 
This was the time of Zhu Xi, second only to Confucius in the pantheon of great Chinese philosophers. Zhu Xi brought Neo-Confucianism to China, and rather than focusing on the Yi Jing, he called for the study of the Si Shu, or the four books. That's uh, the Da Xue, the Zhong Yong, Lun Yu, and the Meng Zi. If we ever get to a series of podcasts on Chinese philosophy, we'll, we'll look at Zhu Xi and Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucianism combined bits and pieces of Taoism and Buddhism with classical Confucianism. The important thing to know is that Zhu Xi's commentaries of these three classic Confucian texts, plus the Meng Zi, form the basis from which all the questions of the civil service exams were based thereafter. He was also one of the greatest of China's calligraphers. One of the innate problems of the Song was this strong Confucian tradition and the all-pervasive power of these Confucian bureaucrats who pushed every button and pulled every lever that ran everything there was about the government from the capital to the smallest prefecture. The enemy of the Confucianists was always the military, and the Confucian bureaucrats are credited with keeping the Song military weak and ineffective. So much disdain did the Confucians have for the military that they weren't even included among the four classes of society that went shi, nong, gong, shang, scholar, farmer, artisan, and merchant. The old Confucian concept of wu, or battle, or war, was you know, just not considered very good. In 1271, Kublai Khan established the Yuan Dynasty after northern China was captured from the annihilated Jin Dynasty. I told you they get theirs. A succession crisis brought about by the sudden death of his brother put things on hold for Kublai Khan until he was able to sort things out and then become the great Kagan. By 1276, it was all over for the Song. I'll tell you, those who have studied world military history will tell you there was never anything like the Mongols, before or since. They were a one-of-a-kind, foremost in fighting ability for waging fast and furious sustained warfare and in their sheer brutality and just just overall destructive power. I think regardless of the effectiveness of the Song military, it's unlikely they could defend against the power and savagery of the Mongol war machine. I'm going to do an episode one day on their history. They've been around a long time. Their history as a people begins around the time of the Han Dynasty, and there's a debate who they were, but most sources I read say they were probably branches of the Xianbei tribes rather than the Xiongnu. In any case, we'll focus on this at a later time. For now, let's just say that the beginning of the end for the Song came about with the Mongols. Genghis Khan and his gang, after suffering insults and humiliations from the Jurchens for years, invaded them in 1211. In 1213 and 1214, it was a bad year for anyone up in northern China. For those were the years the Mongols were just destroying everything in their path and began to simply overwhelm the Jin dynasty. In 1214, the Jin, they cry uncle and offer tribute in order to stop the destruction and Afflicted by Genghis Khan and his Mongol armies, by 1234, these Jurchen people, who had been such a terror to the Han Chinese, were themselves conquered by a more powerful force unseen on this earth since the beginning of history. Song Chinese forces couldn't for the life of them hold back the Jurchens and were easily subdued by them. And as I said, the Song suffered every kind of indignity at the hands of the powerful proto-Manchus or Jurchens, and then along comes Genghis Khan, and before long, uh, the Jurchens end up becoming a vassal state of the Mongols rather than face destruction. But uh, Ogade Khan, the third son of Genghis Khan, uh, he ends up moving on the Jin anyway, and he crushes them in 1234. And then seven years earlier, they had already made mincemeat of the Western Xia, if you remember them. Those were the Tangut people. Genghis Khan, in fact, died during the siege of their capital in 1227. So the Song rulers, hearing about this, had to have felt that it was going to be curtains for them sooner or later. With all their enemies conquered by 1234, the Song dynasty knew it was only a matter of time before they themselves were targeted next by the Mongols. There's only 45 more years at this point for the southern Song, and it wasn't an easy four and a half decades with this sword of Damocles hanging over their heads all the time. Now, it's important to note when the Mongols were putting the finishing touches on the Jin dynasty, the Song had allied themselves with the Mongols, and with the Jurchens on the run, they joined in on the fun of finishing off the Jin. So the Mongols and the Song had this sort of treaty. 
But once the Jin were out of the picture, the Song forces thought that it was okay to retake all their old captured northern capitals, like Luoyang, Chang'an, and Kaifeng. Now, the Mongols didn't like this and felt it betrayed the treaty they had, and so this led to war. And, as I said, the grandson of Genghis Khan, Monke Khan, he dies in this battle against the Song in Chongqing in 1259, and it's only when Monke Khan dies that you have this succession struggle for the top spot in the Mongol Empire. If not for this, the battle would have continued and perhaps the Song would have met a sooner extinction. Monke Khan, by the way, is credited with the defeat of the lands today known as Iraq, Syria, and as well as the uh, Southeast Asian lands of Nan Chao, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and Cambodia. But, as I said, there was this power struggle going on with the Mongols that bought some time for the Song. But Monke Khan's younger brother Kublai, he emerged on top in 1264, and then Kublai was, as you might recall from an earlier podcast, the favorite grandson of Genghis Khan. And this civil war sort of breaks up the Mongol Empire with Kublai really only controlling uh, essentially China and Mongolia. Seven years later, in 1271, the Yuan Dynasty is founded by Kublai Khan. So Kublai Khan has to get rid of the southern Song before he can claim title to the emperorship of all of China. Right now, he was emperor only of the north of China, occupying the lands of the Liao, Jin, and western Xia. The big prize was still not his yet. Now, the Song and the Mongols had not been at peace. The war between the Song and Mongols ran in phases. The first phase ran from 1235 to 1248, which ended in a ceasefire. And the second phase ran from 1251 to 1260 and ended right after the death of Monke Khan. Now comes the final phase, which ran from 1268 to 1276. It wasn't a case of the Mongol army just moving in and crushing everything in its path. The Song, with all these rivers, wasn't as easy to conquer as the north. There were several years of pitched land and naval battles fought on the great rivers of the south. By 1276, it was all over, and it took three years of mopping up before the southern Song was down for the count in 1279. The imperial capital in Lin'an, or Hangzhou, as this town is known today, was taken by the Mongols, and this forced the imperial court to flee and get set up in the city of Fuzhou in Fujian province in 1276. The next year in 1277, the Song Emperor and his court were chased out of Fuzhou, and they flee even further south to the great port city of Quanzhou. The imperial court and their loyal hangers-on figured they would just sort of wait out the Mongols, and they boarded vessels with the intention of being a government in exile. They sailed as far south as you can go in continental China into Guangdong province. They first sought refuge in, of all places, Lanto Island, which today in Hong Kong is such famous landmarks as the airport and Disneyland. The last stand for the Southern Song took place down in the south of China in Xinhui County near Jiangmen in Guangdong province. It was there where the loyal Song general Zhang Shijie, who had been fleeing the Mongols all over the place, protecting the emperor, there he made his last stand. So in 1279 it all comes to an end in this city of Jiangmen. Jiangmen today, by the way, it's a city uh, that is home to thousands and thousands of factories that turn out all kinds of uh, made-in-China merchandise found in all the big retail chains across the USA and around the world. This event on March 19, 1279, was known as the Battle of Yamen, or the Yamen Yi, with all lost and the Mongols about to deliver the final thrust of the sword on the southern Song, the loyal military commander, Lu Xiaofu, together with the eight-year-old last emperor of the Song, Huai Zong, uh, jumped from a cliff and committed suicide rather than face the humiliation of defeat and capture. The entire imperial court in exile, who had followed the generals Zhang Shijie and Lu Xiaofu all around Fujian and Guangdong, they also made that suicide leap from those cliffs near Yamen, so that it was said tens of thousands of corpses floated in the sea near where the southern Song made their last stand. It was a very dramatic ending indeed. And that was that. Once again, the Han Chinese lost control of China and the Emperor, a Nan Han, ruled the traditional lands of the Middle Kingdom from the north, south, east, and west. But as you may recall from the 
earlier podcast I did on Kublai Khan, this emperor ended up becoming so Han Chinese in his ways of leading that his Mongol allies and family poured scorn on the great Khan for embracing Chinese culture over his own Mongol steppe culture. So that's the end of the great Song dynasty, together with the Tang. This dynasty saw China reach heights that were unequaled in the world at the time. Chinese culture had a fabulous run for six and a half centuries, from the start of the Tang in 618 until this moment when Lu Xiufu and the child Song Emperor make their death plunge from the cliffs of Yaman, the entire rock-solid foundation of Chinese culture, built brick by brick since the time of Zhou Gong, had, during this period, a sort of big bang. It was a massive explosion of creativity and learning, where all the adornments, filigree, colors, and whatnot were all packed on top of almost two millennia of cultural development. As we have seen, going back to the spring and autumn and warring states periods, nothing was able to keep man down no matter how outrageous or violent the times were. 661 years of the Tang Dynasty from Gaozu, Taizu, Taizong, Wu Zetian, Xuanzong, and then the disunity that followed the Tang, and then the constant threat from the north from all these fierce fighting machines, one more horrible than the other, and for the periods of the Song in the north and then in the south, Chinese culture reached a refinement that really made the world take notice in a way. The humanities, uh, liberal and fine arts, ways of how business was efficiently carried out, technology, transport and logistics, just leaps forward in the understanding of chemistry, physics, astronomy. So much happened during these six and a half centuries. And all the while, fabulously educated and fastidious scholars of the Confucian tradition organized it, cataloged it, embellished and edited all the details of all the history and knowledge. They packaged this for later generations to pour over and further study and write more commentaries about that you know, just enriched this knowledge that came from a culture that began to take shape in 1000 BC under the Western Zhou kings. And a great thing got greater, and greater to the point where now, where we end this podcast episode, the great Khan, Hu Bilie, Kublai Khan, grandson of the greatest conqueror in history, he becomes emperor of China and embraces this great culture over his own Mongol culture. And Kublai Khan, he reigns over a period that promoted this rich culture that had percolated for the past 661 years during the Tang and Song dynasties. And then we see under this Sinophile uh, Mongol emperor, it flowers even some more. Now, I was going to pack in a whole bunch more about some of the bullet points of the Song, but I ran a little long last week and didn't want to hog too many of your megabytes if you're downloading these shows. There are a good five to ten episodes that I see where we can revisit this time period and focus in on all the interesting stuff. During this time, sometime between 1271 and 1275, Marco Polo was walking around China and having his face time with Kublai Khan. At this time, as we close out, he, he sent a message back to Venice describing you know, what he had seen as he wandered around China. And he, one of the things he said, uh, an interesting quote, I tell you that this river goes so far and through so many regions and there are so many cities on its banks that, truth to tell, in the total value and volume of traffic on it, it exceeds all the rivers of the Christians put together plus their seas. So for now, we're going to scratch this topic off the list. And my friends, I'm off to Deutschland Wednesday, not to return until the last day of the Year of the Ox. And then on February 3rd will be the first day of the Year of the Rabbit. I was in Vegas at the Bellagio last weekend, and their over-the-top conservatory off the lobby was all decked out, as it always is every year at Chinese New Year with that beautiful Chinese New Year theme they do. I'm going to re-upload the Kublai Khan episode because, folks, he may be the great Khan and all, but his dynasty only survives for 79 more years after his death in 1294, and then the Han Chinese are back in the saddle again with the Ming Dynasty. This uh, rebroadcast episode of Kublai Khan will serve as the podcast covering the Yuan Dynasty. 
So I'm going to take a break for a week, taking care of all my tasks at hand in Frankfurt, and we'll pick up in the year of the rabbit with the Ming Dynasty and how they were able to overthrow such an all-powerful force of nature as the Mongols. I'm going to be leaving this beautiful L.A. weather. It's been in the 70s and 80s and sunny and gorgeous, the kind of weather that made this part of SoCal famous. I have 20s and 30 degrees ahead of me. Once I'm in Frankfurt, walking in Goethe's footsteps. For anyone who enjoys foreign films, please go rent or stream the 2007 movie Mongol. It uh, traces the story of Genghis Khan as the young Temujin growing up on the steppes of Mongolia, and it's filmed, uh, a lot of it's filmed in Kazakhstan and Inner Mongolia. Just beautiful. Traces his rise to when he becomes the great Khan and begins his conquering of the world. Got an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a bona fide Laszlo Montgomery recommendation. Watching this film and seeing uh, the vastness of this land where they all live, you'll see it really brings some of what I've explained about the steps uh, to life. So check it out if you'd like. So many of you have been sending in your comments and suggestions for future topics, and I wanted to assure you as soon as we finish off The Last Emperor, Puyi, in 1911, it's open season, and we'll once again jump around all over the place and look at all the different gems from Chinese history. And so, from sunny and gorgeous Claremont, California, this is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you the fondest of farewells. Visit me at www.chinahistorypodcast.com and send me a comment or suggestion or just let me know what you think about the show. Take care, everybody.